Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to have on Lauren Berger, who is the career queen and the intern queen. I think it was switched in the order. First is the intern and then it's the career queen. Um, and she is a very successful author, now on her third book called Getting It Together, about how to manage our lives and live more productively. And I am thrilled because we, we jump into a couple of different topics. We understand her story about how she managed her whole career and her, her life of entrepreneurship. But then also we get into how do you deal with stress? How do you deal with time management? How do you make the proper priorities? How do you have the mindset to continually succeed and excel and disconnect and all the important components of her book? So, um, this is an, you want to take notes on this one um, because Lauren has tremendous experience and she's actually done it. Not only has she helped many people, but she herself has lived this life and it's very inspiring. And I recommend you learning and sitting back and enjoying. Hey, congratulations on your new book that just came out. Tell me a little bit about how you got started both from an intern queen, like starting with the whole development of your, of your brand over there to now really helping people take responsibility for their life. Sure. So I started Intern Queen 10 years ago now, which is kind of crazy. So I started the business in 2009 and the goal was to help people get internships and learn how to make the most of them. And over the past 10 years, I've had the privilege of watching so many young, young men and women, you know, go on to achieve their dream jobs. And so I recently launched Career Queen, which is sort of the big sister site to Intern Queen, mm -hmm. so that I can continue the relationship and continue to give these hungry young people advice as they go from that first, second, you know, first or second job after college to that like executive level position. So I'm in a unique position because I get to watch their entire journey from college and now far into their career. And I noticed that a big issue has been, you know, time management and everyone's stressed and overwhelmed and too busy. So when I was thinking of topics for what's now my third book, I thought we all need to get it together. And so get it together has arrived. Amazing. So like at a certain point, did you realize that you were sort of jumping off? I mean, obviously you did that, but was it scary to jump off the bandwagon of let me get a career and then now let me, let me build a business and a lifestyle for myself where I help others get a career? Um, was it difficult to do that? Yeah. Was it difficult? Um, was it intimidating? Cause you're taking sort of the, uh, the, the uncharted path. Yeah. You know, I mean, s sometimes I think it's difficult. Like whenever I go speak to a student audience, I mean, it's unfiltered. So I never know what someone's going to ask. So they might ask me how to be an astronaut and you know, they're really looking to me for advice. So the way that I've, the way that I deal with that is, you know, honesty first right? I'm very um, vocal about what I, what I know and also what I don't know. And, you know, whenever you're giving job or internship advice, it is very circumstantial. It's, you know, what works at one company won't necessarily work at another. So I try to be clear about that. And then I just try to point people in the right direction. Um, so if I don't have the answer, maybe their career center does. But yeah, I mean, it can be a little nerve wracking sometimes to kind of put yourself on this career pedestal and then think, oh no, you know, what if I don't have the answer? Does, does college prepare people anymore? Do you think it does? Is it, is, I, I may, I may, maybe kind of in a more broad <laughs> sense, you know, I think that what's, one of the things that's amazing is, is that you've been able to continue the relationship with people as they go through their career track. But if we can go maybe before that, do you think that right. it's a mistake for people to go into college with the expectation they're going to come out and have any idea what they want to do? You know, yes and no. I mean, it's funny. I'm 10 years into running my own business now. I'm several years out of college. And I felt like over the past couple of years, I've had to figure out how to manage a team. And it's been very difficult for me. And I found myself thinking back to those college communication courses and those group work assignments that I did. Like, I wish more, I'd be attention. Yeah, more so now than I did in my first five years out of college. So I think, you know, like anything else, the knowledge is going to apply in different places of your life. But I do believe that like a solid education 
and you know those academic courses coupled with an internship where you're actually able to apply what you're learning in the classroom to an experience i think that is definitely the formula for success so i am you know fully behind these schools that are advocating for mandatory internships because i think that to leave college and not have that experience of being smack dab in the middle of a company where you want to work is a miss so I applaud, and there's a lot of schools that are, you know, um, making sure that this is a part of the curriculum. So I think that's the way to do it. What are some of the things that you find are the biggest stressors for people? I mean, the, the idea of helping, and, and I'm not sure if, you know, 10 years is a long time in a business, and I'm sure you've seen mm -hmm. sort of the lifestyle and the life cycle of people have, as they've gone through it. Are people more stressed? At what point are they, in their career are they more stressed? And what are some of the major things that, I guess, unnecessarily stress us out? Yeah, I mean, I've seen now, again, so I'm, 30, I'm 34, turning 35, I live in LA, and everyone is so busy. I mean, everyone, and you hear it in regular conversation. When you ask somebody, someone, how are you? They don't say good. They say some form of the word busy, you know, busy, slammed, crave, whatever it is. Um, and, and that's interesting. But what I realized in writing this book is everyone thinks that. I mean, my mom, who's in her mid-60s, who works two days a week, is so busy all the time. And when I talk to college students, they're so busy. So I think everyone is feeling overwhelmed. I think, you know, there's a lot of contributing factors. One is, of course, technology. And we're living in a notifications on kind of landscape where not only are we all connected all the time, but we get notifications about everything all the time. Like if I look at my cell phone now, I have notifications about 20 things that, that you know, nobody cares about. So I think we're just all overly connected. And then you know, because of Instagram and this idea of being perfect and living this active lifestyle all the time, you know, you're always doing Groupon-like activities. I mean, it's, we've just um, placed this unrealistic expectation on ourselves. So I think those are some of the things that are happening. How do, you, how do you talk yourself out of that? Because I mean, especially in LA and in the entrepreneur community that you are a part of and you know, this whole like, maybe it's just everyone I'm following on Instagram, but you know, it, th there is so much of a pressure and I'm sure that it doesn't go away once you hit certain you know, benchmarks of success, but in fact, it probably gets more intense. Um, yeah. so how do you find your own center and kind of live with yourself and be comfortable with yourself and not get swept up in all of this stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. And so in, in my book and get it together, I kind of went on this journey and I'm definitely still on the journey. It didn't end with the book uh, of trying to figure that out. Um, and I think when you are trying to get ahead in your career, there's, or just in your life in general, there's all this pressure on how many friends you should have and how many plans you should have and how much networking you should do and all of that. So I think it's a matter of really evaluate, well, First, realizing that time is the most valuable thing you have and like really thinking about that and believing that and then really making a conscious decision that you're going to watch that time and you're going to guard it with your life. Like you're going to protect it. Um, it's a matter of thinking about what your priorities are. You know, for me, my priorities, I, I'm obsessed with work. Intern, I don't have any kids yet. Intern queen, career queen. I mean, those are my babies. Like I love work. I'm super driven. However, my priorities are my husband and my friends and my family, right? And so when I make decisions, you know, I, you know, with, of course, within moderation, but like I'm prioritizing time with those people. And I think a lot of people are really confused about that. They're like, well, of course my family is the most important, but then if you look at their decisions and how they're choosing to spend their time, it, that's not really reflected. No. So can you can you can you drill into that because yeah. I think that that's very so so let's 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 look at that let, look at it that way. So you have your friends and your and your husband, which are your main can you know the most important parts of right. your life, and then you have this career, which I think that clearly it's it's almost you know you have to it's it's strange to say, but you almost feel more of a kindred you know a, a connection to your career because like that's a pure outgrowth of your creative energy and right. all the effort. So right. how how do you like look at that? How do you break up your day or how do you break up your week in order to really pay attention to the most important parts of your life. Yeah, let's see. So let's, I'm like, let's get into it. How do you do it? I mean, so for example, like I, when I first started Intern Queen, I, I had come from working at a talent agency where everybody has a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so I had this false perception that if I wanted to be successful, I needed a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, I did that at the beginning and I ended up 
fat, broke, <laughs> and tired and bored, frankly, right? And especially in Los Angeles, if you choose to have a meeting with someone, even a meeting, you're literally taking at least three hours out of your day. Even when, I mean, I have a three minute commute to my office. That's it, three minutes. Today's work from home. Right. But if I go to the office, it's a three minute commute. If I decide to go to a meeting really with anyone, it's about a three hour commitment. Mm -hmm. And so really early on, I was like, wait a second, I'm not getting anything done during the day because I'm choosing to go to these meetings that aren't really turning into anything. Like why can't these be phone calls or even Skype conversations? Um, or on the weekends, if I need to get a hike in, like go with a work person, right? And then you're killing two birds with one stone. But so I think like really cleaning those meetings up off the calendar was a big thing for me. And then I really like having the evenings to myself to catch up on work and then to spend time with my husband watching TV or whatever that is. So I'm really weird about what I commit to at night. I mean, most of my good friends, like we hang out on the weekends. We're all doing our own thing on the week. We, during the week, we've kind of established that. We don't need to have like a standing dinner during the week for no reason. You know, every once in a while, but not really. So the only things that can interrupt my husband time are work-related activities. And I just try to look at all of them and say like, is this gonna move the needle? And is this, uh, is this a meeting that has to happen at this time? Because usually it's not. I went to an event last week during the week because it was, an it was a company that I really want to be involved with. I've never been invited to their events before. A friend invited me and I thought, wow, this is like, this is just going to really help advance my career, a great event for me to be at. But other than that, like, you know, so, you usually don't need to go. I'm curious, um, you, you met your husband after you started your business, correct? You? Yes, but very close. So I started in 2009 and I met him in 2010. So he okay. was like at the very beginning. So, so I'm very curious about that concept because in the, I guess you're, maybe it's just that, you know, the, the entrepreneur podcast world, there's always that, you know, it seems to be like the, the partner that you're with at the beginning when you're like hustling and trying to build doesn't wind up being the one that you're with in the end. And mm -hmm. for a lot of people who have, who've been married and have long-term relationships and don't want to give up you know, their, their, their spouse so that they can, you know, advance. Um, do you find that this is something that couples should speak about together? What are some of the tips that you would give about growing and working in an entrepreneurial venture or something where it takes a lot of brain space and time and then still like working and, and, and showing enough, I guess you say honor to the relationship for it to grow and to flourish? Yeah, it's so it's a struggle. So I met my husband at an entrepreneur speaking conference. He's an entrepreneur as well. And I think that's key. Like, I think that there's pros and cons to having two entrepreneurs in one relationship. And we have a lot of people that I know that have podcasts and, and whatnot, like their significant others work with them in their business. So we're a little bit different in that we both run our own businesses separately. He actually has a business partner. I don't. He's very involved in my business. But again, it's just two separate businesses. So I think that's been helpful just in terms of understanding. Both of our businesses require a lot of travel. So again, like there's just a pretty good understanding. But I mean, it's hard. Like I I'm not one who plays it cool. Uh, you know, I'm like, Wait, what, all, is, what, what does that mean? Like all the emotions all the time. You know, okay. I hold nothing back. If I'm upset, everyone knows. If I'm sad, everyone knows. Usually if I'm sad, it's not even for a good reason, you know? Um, but I guess I just wear my emotions on my sleeve. I don't hold back or try to act a certain way. And I never have. So with my husband, he's seen my business at all of the different stages. And I think like we have enough in common and probably enough not in common that it, you know, it just kind of works. But I will tell you that we constantly have to police the relationship. And like, literally, um, he's sort of the CFO of Intern Queen. So we have, a, we have someone that does operations and then I'm the CEO, but he does all the money. Mm -hmm. So he handles all the payroll and spreadsheets and budgeting and things like that. And so we are in a lot of deep business conversations and he often has to say to me or me to him like, okay, take off your business hat. It's time to be my wife again. And those are like two separate people almost, you know, which is weird. Like in a budget conversation, I might be like fighting him for money for the new PR software that I want. Right. That was this week's item. I'm like, I want X amount of money to pay for Cision, right. Which is thousands of dollars. And he's like, no, it doesn't make sense. And I'm like, yes, I want it. 
you know, and, and then he's like, okay, crazy, like now be my wife again, because we got to have dinner. So it's just a matter of like policing each other, I think. I think that, that's such an important concept about, I, I, I love that, policing the relationship. Is that in the book? I'm like, I don't remember. Now I have to look. There is a whole, I didn't get to, I probably didn't go, it's so funny, you write a book and then you're like, three months later, like, is that in there? Right, right. Um, I don't think I went too far into the relationship. What I do talk about in the book um, in regards to him specifically, though, I have a whole chapter about routine. And it is true that when I started running my business, um, I didn't know what to do. Not, I had no, no, no perception. So I thought that running your own business meant you could sleep in until whatever time you wanted. You didn't have to work on Fridays. You really didn't have to work ever if you didn't want to. And um, then I met my husband who'd been running his own business for a few years. He was, he was kind of far into it. And I would watch him and his business partner and they would get up at, you know, 7.30 and they would have their conference calls and they wouldn't stop until 7 p.m. And I got upset at first. I was like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be against all authority. Why are you conforming? And he thought I was nuts, of course. And I slowly started sort of copying their days. I mean, they had a big team. I didn't have anybody. But watching a successful entrepreneur kind of do his thing um, on, on a daily basis really helped me find some structure and balance in my own days. So I really credit my success of like getting my work routine together to him and his business partner. So that, that's actually a very important point that I think you, you can't really emphasize enough is that in a corporate structure or in a college or anything like that, I mean, maybe not college as much, but there's an external you know, system by which you have to plug into. The papers are due by this time. And when a person kind of goes into the, the realm of their own life, like all of those things really fall away. Right. And it doesn't mean that success is going to happen because you're not doing that stuff. It just means that no one else is necessarily going to reach out and tell you what to do. Right. So I think that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a phenomenal concept. What do, you, what do you do with this whole idea? I know that you spoke a lot about in, in your book about disconnecting and to stop scrolling and, and all of these different things where you are, I guess, pulling yourself into center is, you know, I guess is, is a, I mean, it's, it's funny because in all of these business things, there's, there's so much of a spiritual practice that kind of, that, that, that kind of goes along with it. So, you know, in the, in the world of, you have all of these options around you all the time and you're watching 25 different people that are telling you just to hustle and push harder. How do you stop? How do you slow down? And, and what do you do? Yeah. And I think so much of like disconnecting, especially technology wise is about this idea that like you can't, sure there's some tasks that you don't, that are, you know, I'm looking at my to-do list next to me right now. And there's some tasks that they're kind of mindless tasks, you know, follow up with so-and-so, send an email here, send an email there. But then there's like tasks where I'm going to have to focus and block out time. And I cannot like, so for example, today I, I send aggressive amounts of sales emails. So today I will probably try to send about a hundred sales emails. It's 119 in LA, haven't started it yet. So I'm going to have to find time, hopefully before like 6 PM and do these sales emails. If I have all of my notifications going and my phone next to me, that would take me, I mean, I would never finish it. And I just think that like with, you know, you can't focus on projects. You can't get good work done. If you're constantly plugged in, if you have your phone, you know, right side up, looking at Instagram, answering every text as they come in. So I just think like we all need to prioritize our own focus zone and we need to find our focus zone, like whatever it is that works for you, whether it's big headphones or turning off your ring or whatever it is. Um, and then we all have to like get rid of this idea that instant communication is the best way to communicate. Um, and I've really, I'm getting much better at that. And in ways I feel like kind of an, I want to say the word asshole, I apologize, but like, I feel bad. Um, I'll give you an example. I was at a cafe recently and I'm not one that gets like spotted, <laughs> But I had this girl, it was like in my neighborhood, and I had this girl run up to me and she's like, oh my gosh, are you Lauren the intern queen? And I was so caught off guard. I like came from a high like, you have a pen I can sign for you or yeah, something? I was like, it took me a minute to like, huh, what? I was like, yes, that is me. And she was like, I, she said, I thought you hated me because I heard you speak. I sent you a follow-up email and I never heard back. And so I like take out my phone. I look, sure enough, like June 16th, 2018, this girl sent me one email and I missed it. And, you know, I, my instinct was like to feel bad. Like I did something wrong. And then I said, I said to her, I said, 
I so appreciate your email. I love getting emails. You know, I get so many emails every day. I can't get back to everyone all the time. So next time I said, please follow up with me, even if it's two or three times, because if someone's constantly following up, of course I'm going to see the email. But if they're not, I mean, you know, I'm only one person. I don't necessarily see every email that comes through. You blink and you miss it, right? That's just the world we're living in. So I'm really trying to let go of that a little bit because I, again, like, I don't let, think- Let go of what? what, what I'm, what I'm hearing you say, it's, yeah. it's, I think there's, there's one point, which is that she's obviously living in a world where she's assigned all kinds of values and, and, and has all this drama that is <laughs> like, it's just not true. And I think that that's obviously something that a lot of people do. A lot of people have that. Yeah. So that's for sure too, but, but, but what are you saying about yourself? I, yeah, I'm saying that I, I'm trying to let go of this idea that if I don't get back to one email, I'm bad at my job mm -hmm. or I'm like giving someone some sort of feeling by doing that. So okay. like by not answering an email, I've like completely missed. I had a, a company send me an email the other day about a business proposal that I would have loved to get back to, but unfortunately... I had meetings all day and I didn't see, you know, I'm trying to disconnect a little bit. I took my email off my phone so I don't see it when I'm on the treadmill all the time. And so I saw it the next day. And by the time I responded, so it took about 24 hours for me to respond. She was like, sorry, too late. And I wrote back and said, you know, in the future, I, I'm not like attached to my email. So in the future, if it's an emergency, like, you know, here's my cell phone number, please text or email or call me, pick up the phone and call me because I don't want to miss opportunities because I'm not like, you know, glued to my phone. Cause I think that's, what's kind of getting us all into this mess is that we're so glued to our phone. We're so worried about missing one thing and, and you know, you disconnect and then you don't want to feel like you've messed up by doing that. So I'm, I'm really trying, I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but trying to like detach and convince myself and the people around me that, you know, it's okay. And I'm not going to see everything that comes through and that doesn't make me, you know, bad at my job or an unresponsive CEO or any of those things. I think it's also a beautiful idea that, that this idea of trying to convince yourself because, <laughs> you know, no, I mean, it's I, the, 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 the development, uh, you know, it's, it's on one hand, you can look at someone and they have completely detached the world. And then you look at everybody else, and they're completely, you know, like running around in the rat race. I think that, that this awareness and just cultivating the awareness is such a crucial part that, you know, if, again, like the idea is, you know, most people might hear what you're saying and, and say, well, you know, there's no way I'm going to take the email off my phone. And the, the point is, it's not, not, not like, who cares about that? Just right. start to set goals in your life right. and you will eventually move into those goals. Exactly. Right. Okay. It's like if you, all right. Uh, my best friend is a um, celebrity publicist. She can't take her email off her phone. I get it. But I said, like, what can you do? You know, can you take two hours on the weekend and just not take your phone with you to brunch? Like, what are the small things that you can do so that you feel like you own your time um, and your time doesn't own you? <laughs> well, no, that's, that's, that's the most important thing is it's like we feel very boxed in because on one hand, we want something. On the other hand, it's completely impractical with, the life, with your life. And then that question, I think, is so crucial. It's like, okay, well, what can you do? And, and it's just a matter of, of moving the, moving the, whatever it is that, you know, the needle a little bit and that, that could, that could make a big difference. Um, just quickly, tell me a little bit about your creative process now as a, uh, a three-time author. How do, how do you cultivate your material? What are some of the strategies that you use to, to be able to write? Like what's, what's that look like for you? Yeah. Um, it's funny. So I'm actually in the brainstorm process now and then in the proposal process now for book number four. Yeah. So it just keeps going. So I'm in it. It's interesting though, this, this last book, get it together. This took the longest in terms of like my first book came out 2012, then 2014 for my second book. And then this one didn't come out until 2018. So there was the biggest gap there. And, um, I think get it to, you know, writing an internship book is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot on the market. It was going to be advice for interns. My second book, while the career space is very crowded, you know, it was going to be like what I wish I was told before my first job. Um, this book, I think because it wasn't like such a clear category with Get It Together, it was a little bit harder. Um, I'm trying to think of what the first title was, and I can't remember what it was, but this one took on a lot of different forms, and it was a little bit difficult because my publisher at, uh, my second book was with HarperCollins, my publisher had left. And so I was kind of transferred to the new person. And it's tricky because, you know, when you're an author, any sort of creative type, you want to own your work. You want it to be you. Um, you want to serve your audience properly. And the, the new person, she didn't really see eye to eye. And she kind of pushed me to make the book super academic. 
So I like went full force, you know, talking to all these uh, psychology professors and doing all this research. And by the time we were done, it was like, it wasn't my book anymore. And I didn't even know who would, I didn't even like, I wouldn't. You weren't even interested anymore. Yeah, like I didn't know who would read it. And so we kind of pivoted, parted ways with that publisher. And then I kind of said, you know what, I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to revamp this thing. And this is only the book proposal. So this is like a sample chapter, not a whole book. And I said, I'm going to flip this and I'm going to speak to my audience. Like, I'm going to speak to those that need it and I'm going to do this my way. And then we found a new publisher. Um, and, you know, it's not about the company. It's just the people that you're working with. Um, and we have a new relationship now with McGraw-Hill. And it's really cool because the, the woman who's the publisher at McGraw-Hill or my publisher, she was an intern queen fan in college. Oh, wow. So Are you serious? Yeah, it's really come full circle. So it's been really, you know, a different experience to be able to work with someone who can look at the ma material as like a former or yeah. current fan. Um, so it's been really interesting. But I mean, writing for me was really difficult. And it goes back to all the content that's in Get It Together. I think I actually talk about that in the book. Like, try I wrote a book in 2011 and in 2013. It came out a year later. And I think that was before Instagram. <laughs> so I mean, writing a book in 2018, just again, we live in this notifications on land and I couldn't focus. And I, I guess a big difference too is back then I didn't have a team. So if I wanted to go sit at a coffee shop all day and like not take any calls, I could do it. Now I'm running a team and it's a young team. So a team that's learning. I mean, we have 10 uh, team members at Intern Queen. So I couldn't write between like eight and five. So it either had to be early in, early in the morning or late at night. So I would just like Starbucks hop mm -hmm. to every Starbucks possible, drink a coffee, throw it out, next location, drink a coffee. I mean, just the focus was really, really difficult. So, um, you know, kudos to all the authors out there that are, that are sitting somewhere right now trying to get that, the words on paper. I mean, it's, it's really hard. Amazing. And if there was like one or two takeaway pieces of advice for, you know, for the, for the person that's going to the job world or someone that's in the job world that's trying to find who's, you know, stuff is all over the place and they want to get it together, what, what would it be? Um, so just in general, I would say number one is like, get rid of that to-do list that has a hundred things on it. You know, pick your top three to five and that's it. Like take everything else off. I would say try to go from like a paper to-do list to like a shared Excel spreadsheet or like some sort of digital document because you're going to lose that napkin. You're going to lose that piece of paper. And then my next piece of advice is like block the time in your calendar. What I realized while trying to get it together, and I talk about this in the book, is that my calendar would be so packed and then I'd have this to-do list and there was no time to do the things on the to-do list. And so blocking the time was really, um, really crucial. Outstanding. Lauren Berger, how can people find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, so follow me. I'm on Instagram at intern queen, at official career queen, and at official Lauren Berger. We have three. Nice. Um, my book, Get It Together, is everywhere books are sold. And um, we have internqueen.com and careerqueen.com. There you have it, folks. Another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, we have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.